Thanks everyone for coming. And um, I'm so excited to be part of welcoming uh, Nick, as I know him, to, uh, to Claremont, to the, to the five C's. Um, so um, when I was still a bookseller in Berkeley, and I was an aspiring writer, I used to go and work uh, at a cafe on College Avenue in Ashby called Roma. And at that time, uh, uh, Nick's first stories were just appearing in The New Yorker, and I was very excited about them. And they were, some of them were the pieces of what would become his first novel, The Mezzanine. And um, then one day I figured out that this guy, this tall guy, at the table beside me in Roma, who was correcting proofs in what looked very much like the New Yorker font, was in <laughs> fact Nicholson Baker, this, this new writer I was all excited about. So I, I sort of forced myself on you a little bit there in Berkeley. Um, when, when no, I was no. just a... I, yeah. I have a different, I have a code. <laughs> this wonderful, gracious person said, would you like to get coffee? And we, 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 we ran into each other at Roma, which is, uh, is kind of a big place that, that you go when you have New Yorker galleys that you want to show off, you know. <laughs> but we actually um, met at a little place called Royal Coffee, I think. Right. Just to, just to add that note and talked about what you were up to. Well, yeah. So, um, and then, uh, incredibly and beautifully, um, Nick moved from, was it directly from California to Maine? Is that, or were there stops in between? I don't actually know we this. Lived in, I, we lived in Berkeley, California. We had two children, and we had a little bungalow, and it was too small. And we were in search of affordable housing and traditional schools, so we moved to Maine. And Maine is a, is a really, is an easy place to live after Berkeley. Um. It's, it's a really uh, special place for me, and I, I go there every summer, but um, the point of this story is that um, Nick and his family moved to the town a couple of miles from where my dad was living. And so, um, uh, and, and we also have something in common, which I wouldn't have known except for this, which is we have Quakerism in our family, and uh, so, Nick ended up attending the same Quaker meeting as my dad, and, and uh, so I would see him in this very informal and sweet circumstance up there. And of course, my father was a, had become a big fan of your work as well and was quite amazed to have you in his orbit there in Berwick, Maine. Uh, Do you know what a Quaker meeting is like? <clears throat> it's very, 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 very quiet. And you can hear the clock tick. It's, it, have you been to, you've been to Sure, oh, yeah. loads of them, yeah. This is an old building, and there's a clock, and you walk in, if you're on time, you walk in. If you don't, you wait outside and wait for the moment when the children come out, but, which I'm, I'm off at a little late. But you walk in <clears throat> and sit down, and the clock ticks, and nothing happens. It's, and there are elders there are people who look very wise and, and, and very, not exactly religious. I'm an atheist. Um, I'm an atheist Quaker. But, but they're one of the wise people that, who was there, what, I, I made, didn't make the connection, actually, that, that, it, that Brown Latham, this wise man, was your dad. Incredible. And he's a painter, too, a really talented painter who does these beautiful, colorful explosions of, of life on the canvas. It was very wonderful for me to have you recur in this magical way in, in my world. The more important point is I've been reading uh, Nick's writing continuously, and I have lots of questions for him that will encompass this new work, Substitute, about his, his recent Gallivant as a uh, as a substitute teacher in Maine public schools, uh, which is a very strange thing for him to have done, and he'll have to account for himself to us all. But I also want to talk about it on writing terms and talk about his career a little bit. I brought kind of a a, a, a cross section, uh, not everything, but of of a lot of things. Um, and you know, one of the things that interests me the most, because I'm in the same situation, is the fiction writer who finds themselves writing nonfiction. And I actually. I'm curious to begin with this general question. Did you expect to do this kind of work, or did you think that you would only or primarily write novels? 
I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I, my first book, The Mezzanine, is about a guy who gets, by the way, first I just want to say, this is such a beautiful room and such a beautiful campus. And, and thank you, Corinna, for setting it up. And thank you for coming to this nice, nice place. And I took a picture of the alley of trees and the mountain. And I'm just overjoyed to be in this paradise, really. Mezzanine was about a guy who worked um, in a big office building somewhere. And he's basically me, although I changed his name and changed some of the chronology. He gets on an escalator and rides up to the mezzanine level because I worked on the mezzanine level. This was on Wall Street, on, on Water Street, near Wall Street. And I was a stock analyst. I was a oil and energy and geothermal energy analyst right out of college. Can you believe that? Talked my way into the job. And um, I put everything that I knew about office life into that book. Um, and I don't know that I was thinking whether I would ever write anything else. I think nonfiction, I, my parents subscribed to Ski Magazine. My father was in advertising, so he subscribed to a whole lot of different, and I read a lot of nonfiction journalism as a kid. Look Magazine was a really interesting so I always had in the back of my mind that it's possible to write factual things. But the problem with factual writing is that it actually has to be true. Um, and fictional writing can be true, but you can kind of reorder things a little bit, make it easier to understand. Somewhere along the way, though, I thought um, I'd set all my books in order in this uh, office that I was renting in Berkeley. And I'd written uh, s several books and published them, and I thought I want to write. I want to write something that's factual, where I I'm not a lonely person writing a novel. I get to call up people on the phone and say I'm writing a piece for the New Yorker about X, and I'd love to talk to you about what you know. It was because it's friendlier. It's 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 uh, nonfiction allows you to connect to the world. Um, the first time I did it was, was an Esquire piece about model airplanes. They said, what would you like to write? And I thought, well, I liked building model airplanes as a kid. Um, maybe I'd like to go to the factory. So they said, well, you know, go to the factory. So I just went there and they gave me a factory tour. And that is a, a great thing to start with. So I just wrote about what it's like to build model airplanes, but also what it's like to watch the kit that a model airplane comes out of being squashed out of a gigantic injection molding machine. <clears throat> That's great. So uh, one of the things this reminds me of is the, uh, you know, with the mezzanine, which you described uh, partly, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to elaborate on the description. The, the book is a uh, famously, uh, to those who, who've read it, a kind of super exploded rendition of a very, very brief amount of time. The character in, in, re, in the real time of the story only manages to ride the escalator. Is that right? It's a travel book. Yeah, it's a travel book. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a, it's a book that uh, begged the term miniaturist. And you're, I feel that in a way your first reputation was as a miniaturist, that what you did was take tiny things, and maybe the model airplane is in, in a way a nonfiction equivalent of this, and unpack them into extraordinary uh, levels of close observation and, and um, to slow time down. And, um, and this also had a kind of a archaeological quality. It was like you were enshrining things. So you'd, you'd notice shoelaces and the eyelets on shoelaces, and you'd write about that for a few pages. And it was like the world was being lovingly, precisely uh, cataloged. But it also was kind of close work, tiny work. And one of the things that strikes me about both your fiction and your nonfiction uh, is that you began to become interested in something that was um, no less detailed, but, but had this uh, archival breadth to it. It's like the library became the central image for you after you wrote about the destruction of the paper 
in libraries. And you started to write books that are kind of archives in and of themselves. And I was, I was contending with Substitute. And I don't know how many of you have had a chance to really look at the new book at all. But what's astonishing about what Nick did in his writing about being a substitute teacher is that he didn't generalize about the experience. It's a kind of a giant catalog of moments. Every day he walked into a classroom as a substitute teacher is, is accounted for. And in a sense, it feels as though every minute of every day that you spent as a substitute teacher is accounted for. And every kid who speaks is given a name. And every classroom is, 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 you know, is recorded. It's as though you're kind of creating an archive of your own experience. And in that sense, it's like a, a forest of miniatures. And you've stepped, you've stepped further away from, from the close work. And at the same time, you've preserved that spirit of uh, scrupulous recording. Um, in, instead of making a sweeping, uh, you know, a sweeping statement about this experience. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, I think that's, <clears throat> that's exactly right. What I, well, the first time I tried to do this was um, I wrote a book called Human Smoke, which was about the build-up to the Second World War. <clears throat> I went to an alternative high school a public high school in Rochester, and there was, and I did, I did some work. I watched a lot of reruns on TV. I messed around. I wasted time, but I did do some work. But I didn't take really any American history at all, and I didn't. I had very, a very foggy notion of of the history of war. Um, somewhere along the way, I think it's because I'm married to a really smart woman. Margaret Brentano, who's, who was a pacifist at Bryn Mawr College when I was still a, a, an entire, an, uh, you have no idea what a tiresome um, neoconservative I was. Uh, it just, uh, I, I don't know what came over me, but there was a bad phase. But, she's, <laughs> but she, was a, she was willing to put up with that, I said, I'm not quite sure why. But, she, you know, I, gradually, over the years, being married to her, I, I understood. And somewhere along the way, I wanted, to un, I wanted to figure out what the Second World War was all about and why it happened the way it did. The, the, the most, the worst five-year chunk or six-year chunk in, in the history of mankind, in a way. So I started to write these anguished paragraphs, and then I also used a lot of newspaper sources and, and diaries and speeches, and I pieced it together. But there was a lot of me in the book, and she read, she always reads the things that I write, and I showed her something like 50 pages of the book. And she said, it's good, but take yourself out. This war is so huge, and it's so sad, and it's so complicated, and you've got these moments of decision, these fragments. Leave yourself out. So I went and started at the beginning, and I took myself out. And it was a, it was, and I, I knew she was right, because it hadn't felt right for me to be writing about how sad something is. Just let the things th speak. So that was how I learned to Sometimes just to let what people say register and just and leave my own opinion out of it. And so something similar happened with Substitute, which was that I have watched, I watched both my kids go through main public schools and they had ups and they had downs and we enforced the homework and we paced around the kitchen table and we bought foam core uh, backing so they could do their high school projects and all. And, um, and I had lots of theories and thoughts about education. Are there any teachers here? I just want to say something about this, because I am not a teacher. I'm only barely a substitute teacher. I am somebody who dipped in. Teaching is hard. I'm not a seasoned teacher. I'm just somebody who decided partway through the writing of this theoretical book about American education, that I was an imposter, that I 
did I didn't know what I was talking about, and the only way to find out what was going on in American classrooms was to get in, in them and stand up and be vulnerable in front of people, in front of young people. So I took a six-week, I guess it was a six-week training program to be a substitute teacher. The requirements in Maine are that you have to have a clean criminal record, obviously, and you have to have good fingerprints, and uh, you have to have a high school diploma. And once we finished this program, we were all in. We could teach. We were teachers. We were sort of temporary teachers. So it allowed me to get into these classrooms and find out what was going on. And the phone would ring at uh, 5.30 in the morning, and I kept the phone under my pillow, so, and I changed the ringtones because they were distressing. But, hello. And then the sub-dispatcher, think of her job. She has to get up at 4.30 and look at all the, pe all the people who are sick or bored or that don't want to go into school that day. And she has to call the substitutes and plead with them, come in, we need you. So she would call and she would say, I don't know if you're interested in, in subbing today, but we have an opening in. And then she would say, 11th grade remedial math. Or she would say, fifth grade or kindergarten. And I never knew. And I would just say, OK. And I would drive north and go to this place that was a, not a prosperous school district and do my best to get through the day. And after, I, I think it was only three or four days into, into doing that that I realized that the, the educational theory was very, is all very well. But what we have to do is listen and think about what kids do to get through each day. We have to listen to what they talk about and really take seriously the decisions that they make. Take myself out of it and just, well, I couldn't entirely because I was the teacher, so there's a lot of me talking and making bad jokes and trying to get people to do what they're supposed to do, passing out worksheets. But as a theorist, I took myself out mostly. There are a few little indignant moments, but... And just let the day speak for itself so that this chronicle, although I have my opinions about what should happen, I'm hoping would be actually interesting to somebody who disagreed completely with me, which was also true about human smoke. Because there were a lot of people who disagreed with me about a kind of pacifist view of World War II. But th even they sometimes felt that they were happy to know some of the tidbits that I offered them. So the idea is to pull yourself out as a nonfiction writer and let the truth kind of grow up out of the paving stones. That's great. I, I'm, and I'm feeling very smug because uh, the thought I had halfway through Substitute was this is this is like human smoke. This is modeled on that same kind of uh, forest, not uh, trees, not forest approach to writing a nonfiction account of something. Um, so I'm sure that with the educators in the room, uh, when we do open to questions, you're going to uh, get to uh, you're going to be asked to offer up some of your prescriptive thinking that you withheld or that's only implicit in the book. But so I'm interested in this sense in which you are present. You know, there's, for a fiction writer, there's an odd uh, sensation at you seeing operate, uh, seeing you operate the character of Mr. Baker, the substitute teacher, uh, in, in these scenes. Um, was, was there a temptation to uh, uh, exaggerate your own um, uh, buffoonery or to uh, try to see the student, see, see yourself as the students were seeing you? Um, did you begin to see Mr. Baker as a kind of uh, protagonist? I, I, I always felt self-conscious about writing my name on the board and being called Nick, Mr. Baker. And early on, I would say I'm Nick Baker and then realized that I, I shouldn't say that, you know. But I love, I, I, in the end, the teacher is a Mr. or a Ms. or a Mrs. It's just the way it is in Maine. And the students, 
when I would write my name, Mr. Baker, on the board, they would come up with, with uh, dry erase markers onto a whiteboard, and they would make little flowers and decorations around my name. You know, this, this is the guy who is in front of us. This is the, cra what is he, who, who is he? So I was a form of entertainment. My name was entertaining. What do you bake, you know? Um, just, wh wh who are you? Was, was interesting, and I realized that that was what I, I had to offer, was, was every other day, they knew what was gonna happen, but there was this hole in the month that I was spackling over. That was my job. But I was also just, I, the rules were gonna be different. I wasn't gonna know everybody's name easily. I had these plans, these sub-plans that were so terribly important to me that I held on to them all day long and they got very finely wrinkled and sometimes I lost them and felt bad and would go in a search. But, the, but I was nominally in charge, but really they were going to explain how the class worked to me. And there was always somebody really, really nice in the class who would come up and say, Mr. Baker, now we want to discuss the lunch choices. Or, <laughs> Mr. Baker, when they start to get loud like this, sometimes we go to the guidance office. Um, and then she would lead me to the guidance office. And the guidance counselor would be busy, let's say. And she would say, well, Mr. Baker, when the guidance counselor is busy, we go to the principal's office, you know. And the principal's name is Mr. Pierce. And I would say to Mr. Pierce, Ms. Mr. Pierce, they're very nice kids, uh, I'm not, I'm not succeeding in, they're very loud. <laughs> he, this was a class, this is the class, this was the early, this was chapter something, four, three. This was the worst day, I thought, of my life in the middle of the class. I thought, is this the worst day of my life? I think it is. Um, and and uh, I said to him, they're being very loud, and he said, yes, they're very loud. And, the, and the, one of the loudest kids in the beginning of the class um, said, Mr. Baker, I just have two words for you. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, he's one of the kids who's not going to be a problem. Oh, no, no. <laughs> he was so wild and so crazy and so angry and so disruptive. And at the end of the day, after a huge kind of drama of, of, the, of the principal coming in, giving a speech and everything, um, I said, man, you were really out of control in the middle of the day, and now, now look at you, you're, you're, you're under control. And he said, I'm like that. I get wild, and then I calm down, you know? <laughs> and I, I, I love that there was this combination of of um, kiddishness and self-knowledge, you know. And, that, and it made me happy, really, to be able to record the gradual moments that a day, a sort of moment by moment, where a day moves toward chaos, and then how it veers away from chaos. What happens? Why would it, why do they calm down? Turns out that in that day, what, turn, what calmed everybody down was that the last thing in the, in the day, when everyone was exhausted and unhappy, we were supposed to read, Roll, uh, I was supposed to read chapter two of Roald Dahl's book about the BFG, the Big Friendly Giant, which I'd never read. And I just started reading, and it was this beautiful chapter about this Big Friendly Giant, the BFG, who blows these dream powders into the windows of kids, and they have these dreams that are not dreams, but really waking reality. And I came to the end of the chapter, and um, I said, should I, should I keep reading? And they said, yes. And they, that was the only time that they'd spoken in unison since the Pledge of Allegiance. It was a, it was a and, they, and they actually took me seriously after that, because, not because I had done anything, I just read aloud what Roald Dahl wrote. But, the, but the somehow, and this happened over and over again, the experience of listening to fiction read aloud. Like, there was another class, a high school class, where they had to read 
they had to li they listened to, it was a remedial class, they listened to the teacher read Stephen King's Shawshank Redemption. These were kids who were, you know, this one guy was taking mango juice things and putting it in his eye and stuff. And they all went quiet and listened to Stephen King, another Mainer. Um, just describe what was going on in the prison in the Shawshank Redemption. So, Great. fiction read aloud. Great. So, it suddenly occurred to me something that hadn't when I was, um, when I was reading the book, which is that, in a way, the book extends your interest in interstitial moments. You know, if the mezzanine announces this interest with the, you know, the lunch hour and the, the escalator ride, it's like a, a between moment that's meant to be forgotten and you've concentrated on it. And, and in the fermata, in your novel, the fermata, you have a character who can sort of stop time and move while everyone else is stilled. And it's this catching people in the middle of things when they are absent that interests you so much. And it, of course, suddenly I see that the substitute teacher as being a kind of um, quintessence of the interstitial reality because what kid will ever remember, you know, uh, their, their sense of fourth grade will, will heal up around the wound of the day that the substitute came in, right? And it will never be recorded in their memories. Do you remember any of your substitute teachers? Well, I always felt sorry for them. And that was the, that was the thing that I remembered, was, the, was that the substitute teacher was, a, was sincerely trying to do something and nobody was, was listening. And I knew that was, and I knew that was the, the basic fact of being a substitute. And I said to my son, um, I think the way to do this book is to become a substitute. And he was in high school at the time, and he said, Dad, they'll crush you. <laughs> you know, don't do it. Um, but that was kind of exciting. You know, it, it's, it's kind of useful to find out what it feels like to be the low, on the lowest level of something. Here's this hierarchy of school. The principal is the top. He's answerable to the superintendent who, whose only job, as far as I could tell, was to call snow days. But there's this, the principal, and then there's the football coach, and then there's some teachers, 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 teachers. And then there's the students, the smart kids, and then there's the less smart kids, and then there's the kids who are 25 assignments behind whose iPads have been confiscated. And then there's the staff who keep the place clean. And then at the very bottom is a substitute. And that's a useful position to be in. It's, an, it's not my first book about education, though. The first book was I, we were living in England. And um, my daughter, Alice, went to a, a British private school called King School in Ely, England. And, and I picked her up from school and I, I would interview her about her experiences. And that became a, a novel called The Everlasting Story of Nori, which was another one where I wanted to slow things down and find out what a, what a kid, happened to be my daughter, but what a kid was actually thinking. So that was another dry run for this book. Great. So, um you say that you were on the lowest rung, and I, I don't doubt it, but there was another sense in which you, um, you experienced a freedom. You knew you could, in a way, beguile or cajole them uh, because of your special status that, that wasn't available to the everyday teacher. I don't think I felt, I could beguile and cajole, I could cajole, but I could not get results often. I mean, what, what you have to do as a substitute teacher, anybody in this place who's ever done it knows, is you get a stack of worksheets. Because the, the, the real teacher doesn't know who's gonna come in. It, and doesn't, and uh, if it's a science teacher and I'm there, I'm supposed to teach about the the nature of chemical reactions versus physical reactions. Well, I vaguely remember a little bit about that, but uh, what I have to do is pass out worksheets and say the first worksheet you're gonna, and does anyone have problems with question nine? And put your name at the top of the page. You know, some of the kids, that was the big thing that they did. Get your name down, you know. And then the next set of worksheets, and then the next set. 
there was usually eight or nine worksheets throughout the day. So that was, that was the job of the substitute teacher. And I understand why that happens. It's because the real teacher doesn't know. And one of the teachers, the science teacher, I think, or I think it was a science teacher, said, I never look at any of the work that kids do when there's a substitute. I think, I am busting my... I am killing myself to get these worksheets done. You're not going to even look at it, you know? But of course, that's a rational thing. What, why would he look at it? It was a terrible day intellectually for everyone concerned. Um, and yet, I think that there were little moments where I was able to explain something, you know? I was able, I, some fragment of knowledge would come back to me. Or I would quick look up something on Wikipedia. Like, uh, we had to talk about the uh, kingdoms of human, or the kingdoms of, uh, the kingdoms of organisms. And, and Linnaeus, and I, would, I read up on Linnaeus and gave a little potted lecture about Linnaeus. And, some t and, and this is the other thing that I didn't understand. It's a Groundhog Day kind of situation. It's a, you know, I'm interested in time. So a high school and a middle school, the kids come in sleepily and they're sitting there with their backpacks and then there's some bells that bang and everybody says the pledge and then they, and then you have to teach a class and they have to do these worksheets, but first you have to sort of give them the context. You have to tell them who, what is, why would you classify things? What is protista? What are, what are archaebacteria? Whatever it is. Give your little thing and then they would get to work and then the class was over. And then it started all over again with a whole, whole set of new names that I would have to take attendance, call out, and then as that class is over. And then there's a, maybe a, another class, and then there's lunch. And so it was just repeated over and over again. So the story would evolve because it was repeated. I don't, I, I, it's a very, very strange thing to do to grown-ups, to teachers, to paid teachers, smart people, and it's a very strange thing to do to kids, too. <laughs> it's a situation that is... You, can, you know, it's like watching the, the ice flows break in the, in the north, just calving, they're calving. Education is just falling apart. It's just, it's just crumbling because everybody has quicker ways to find things out. If you're interested in how to fix something, you look up and you get a micro lesson from YouTube. Everybody understands that there's a gigantic world of miscellaneous knowledge. And the curriculum is this set of a few subjects that's presented as if, as a, oh, sort of a proxy for human knowledge. And it doesn't make sense anymore. It just doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't make sense that we know it doesn't make sense because it's being rejected. It's being forgotten by 95% of the kids who, who are sitting there, at least in my district. So um, I've got just a little bit more time with you exclusively and then um, we're gonna invite some questions. Um, and there's so many things I wanna follow up on, but I think the thing I'm compelled to do just, at, just with what you've offered at the end there is to, I mean, you're talking about um, grade school through 12. We're in a <laughs> higher education atmosphere right here. And of course, we're consumed with uh, self-interrogations and um, quite forcible interrogations from uh, outside the, the citadel <laughs> uh, as to whether we still make sense, you know, whether this is a a viable model for uh, activity or, or uh, what you just said so strikingly, a proxy for human knowledge that's no longer really doing anything except representing the idea, but that the action is gonna go elsewhere uh, somehow or it ought to, or that this model is uh, kind of uh, fatuously uh, self, uh, self-perpetuating when it ought to be kind of carved up um, do you do you have a view on that? Do you do you do you hear this conversation going on? 
Well, in a place like this, there's, there's a lot of choice. And, you, and students are given their head a lot of the time. I mean, you have to fulfill certain requirements, but it's a very different flavor and texture of the day. Most of the day, you're not actually in a class. The difference, the, the thing that was so powerfully striking to me as a substitute teacher was, and this was over 28 days, but spread out over a semester, and all classes between kindergarten and, and seniors in high school, is except that they could drop out if they wanted to, but then they had a black mark. All of those kids had no choice. They had to show up at 7.30 in the morning if they were in high school, or 8.30 at quarter to nine if they were in elementary school. So they had no choice. And they're unpaid, and it is, it's a crazy, I mean, why would, the, why would they, I remember one kid saying to me, I, I, he was very silent and he was not happy and the other kids were doing okay. And I went over and said, how's it going for you, my man? And he said, and this was, he was a fourth grader. Do you remember fourth grade? I was a good year for me, it was okay. He said, I've been here for five years. <laughs> you know. It was like a, you know, every weekday, this kid, and he did, and, and I would say the majority of kids were like that. And I mean, I, I know we're here in this place, it's very selective, it's hard to get into, and there's a lot of free time, and you have choice, and it's beautiful, and it's worth doing. Um, that's not true for a lot of school districts all over this country, so we have to ask ourselves, is there something else that we could be doing that would allow them, shorten the day, cut out the homework, allow them to do what they want to do, which is to uh, drive trucks through mud, right? They're interested in that. Re they, there a lot of kids who made money from, as snowplow operators. People, there was a, a woman who fell asleep on her boyfriend's lap in remedial math class because she had closed at McDonald's and she'd gotten out at 3 a.m. the night before. You know, there's a whole reality of what people can actually get money to do in, in the poorer districts of this country that has nothing to do with the quadratic formula or, you know, whether, whether a piece of writing uses an unreliable narrator, whether there's synecdoche, you know what the reform movements of the 19th century were, none of that has, has any interest for them at all. And we have to face up to it. It is not interesting to them and they're going to forget it instantly because it is of no bearing to them. And so it's not gonna make them better citizens to know it, it's just time that they're sitting through. So. Uh, fantastic, thank you. Uh, we're gonna, turn to questions, but let's give Nick a, a thank you right now. Tell me what I'm... So... Oh. Tell me, I don't know why I got so... I, I got theoretical there. That's what happens. But tell me it, what I'm doing... What I was doing wrong is... It would be very helpful to know. So let me add that there are microphones or a microphone that can be uh, rushed over to you. I, I, I think it will make you sound really great and authoritative and it's worth waiting for. So um, put up your hand if you've got a question uh, for Nick, and if I hear a, too long a hesitation, I'll jump in with more, because I've got more, but I, I bet someone could break the ice here. There's someone conveniently close to the microphone. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was just wondering what your recording process for every day was um, when you were a substitute. Would you go home and like um, <clears throat> detail out the day in the way that you put it in the book, or was it was it more like notes throughout the day and sort of how did you really get get that information concrete? That evolved. <clears throat> I thought, well, I, I'll scribble notes, and I had these black notebooks, and I was filling black notebooks, and then at the end of the day, I would stop in a parking lot. And I was completely exhausted, but I would think I've got to write down all the good moments, the bad moments of the day. 
Um, but here's the thing, it's 2016, all right? It, it is, there are, the, I am not gonna pretend to you that I have a phonographic memory, I don't. Truman Capote said that he had a phonographic memory. He didn't, he combined characters and made stuff up. What, I felt I had two responsibilities. This gradually came to me. Um, one was to think about what kids were actually saying and doing in the class. And the second was to protect their privacy. So I had an audio recorder and I recorded every minute of every day, okay. And um, using the notes that I took, and I took also took a lot of photographs of everything on the walls. I didn't take pictures of the kids because that didn't seem right, but I took pictures of the classrooms and um, kind of combined all of the notes that I'd taken and lived through what people said in the audio recordings. And this is a long book because uh, a lot happens in every day. But if I had, I, the truth is, if I had actually provided a real transcript of every day, it would be about 10 times longer. I mean, it, you know, so many words, so many interruptions, so many cross currents and factions are going on in every class that I had to do a lot of sort of living through the day and editing and cutting out and emphasizing. And that was my process. And it was the most immersive thing I've ever done, I think. Because I wrote it um, nine months, starting nine months after I'd done it, which was kind of useful because by then there was a little bit of imprecision. And that allowed me to disguise some of the people involved, all the people involved. Everybody's name has changed. But, it allowed, but, but the fact that I had an actual recording of what people said, which is legal in Maine, um, allowed me to be true to the way, you know, you, you think to yourself that you remember what a kid says. And I would note it down without, without listening or anything. And then I would go back and hear what they said. It was infinitely more interesting, almost always, because the inversion was there and the, the complex and what the kid was, was responding to was there. So that was my method, was to um, sort of combine everything that I remembered and knew and, and my own mood. And then I finished the draft and it was gigantic. It was, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred pages longer than it is now. Um, but there's a lot of, con con you know, do you, do you feel you have to start at the beginning of a book and read to the end? Because I don't feel that. You know, I feel that you, Boswell's Johnson is one of the great books of any period. I've never read it from beginning to end. I just open it and dip in. And. I think what, this is what I'm hoping people will do with this book. It's sort of a, it's, it's a giant boulder in the road. It's saying, look at all of this talk and all of this life. Look at it. If you're interested in elementary school, just look at the elementary school. If, you're, if you teach middle school or you have middle schoolers, look at that. So it doesn't, you don't have to think of this as a long book. It's just a book. Well, but even flipping it open, it embodies the sensory and mental overload of the classroom. You know, it's, it, it, it says, in a way, it, it says, if you want to read this book, you're going to have to also be inside it the way I was inside the classroom. There's no, there's no looking in from outside. Right. I'll tell you a story about the paper of this book, because it's a very heavy book, too, which I've never published such a heavy book. Um, My publisher is Penguin Blue Rider, and they'd published the autobiography of Elvis Costello, which came in at something like a thousand pages. And they thought, oh my God, we can't you know, publish a thousand page memoir by this singer songwriter, Elvis Costello. So they found a special kind of paper that was thinner, but still opaque. 
and they published it, and it looked small. It looked like a shorter book than it was. Don't they call it Bible paper? Yeah, it's sort of like Bible. So, so then when I turned in this enormous manuscript, which I then cut down considerably, but they said we're going to have to use the Elvis Costello paper. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what they did use. Another question. I see a couple here, so we'll go down that run. Thank you. Hi, I am a uh, retired high school librarian, and I have to agree with a lot of what you have said. Uh, I was uh, at a very high-performing high school in Colorado, and there were a lot of mind-numbing things that our kids had to do at the high school level. But do you agree that part of what is happening is because our kids have been convinced that this is what the colleges want? And this is how they're going to get into scripts, is they are going to be doing the grade grubbing. Their ACT scores are going to count. And all of this stuff, all of the teaching to the test that is happening has really uh, been detrimental to our students. The other thing is that getting rid of vocational schools. There are a lot of kids who are not on this track. And we have gotten rid of auto tech. We've gotten rid of the mechanics. We've gotten rid of a lot of the things that kids who do not belong in the regular education system could really use. Both very good points, questions. I taught a metal tech class. Um, uh, I loved it. I, there were big, big machines, and the kids were kind of excited about being able to bend metal in certain ways. Um, it shouldn't be thought of as, you know, so many of the kids who were, who were way behind were able, when I would talk to them individually, they were able to describe to me all kinds of interesting things that I didn't know about that had to do with the mechanical world and um, so, no, so first of all, I want to say something, but I went to this totally free school, completely free, and I typed my own transcript, and I, I mean, I just, I could do whatever I wanted, literally do whatever I wanted, and all I really wanted to do was play the bassoon and uh, pretend to be a composer. And I got out of, and, and I was done. And I applied to college, and I managed to find a college, Haverford College, bless them, partly because I had some distant relatives who went to Haverford, <laughs> um, who accepted me. But I don't think that I was damaged, that I missed out, that my, that there, my cognitive development was, was neglected to the point that, that I was permanently damaged by the fact that I had many, many hours of being able to do nothing at all. I think, in fact, that it helped me enormously. And uh, another thing that I, to, just worth, at, I just spent six months in Singapore as a writer in residence. Singapore is one of the top achieving countries in the world. They, they ace all the tests. They're at the top. They're way above us. Why are they above us? Because they care about this test so much that the, the families actually bankrupt themselves hiring tutors and they work on their homework till one in the morning and, and they were not happy about it. And, they, and they're actually discussing in Singapore how this is a toxic situation. So don't let us move in the direction of Singapore. Singapore has already realized that it's a mistake. They're moving away from Singapore. We're, we should go back, the generation you're a lot younger than I am, but we went through this. Did you have homework? You had some homework. I didn't have homework like my kids have homework now. Right. Yeah. That's the thing. The fact of ever-present, relentless homework every night beginning in first and second grade, which was amazing to me, that has got to stop. It's just, it's got to end right now. And, this, and we've got to relax a little bit pay teachers more, give them their heads, and stop worrying about this thing called the 
common core, as if everybody has the steel cylinder within them of common knowledge. We don't. We all are interested in, in different things, and, and we're, all, we're all trying to find not what is what common knowledge, we're trying to find something that we have to offer that will surprise the world. So I think we just have to go in an entirely different direction. There were a couple more in that same zone, I think. Do you still have faith in the public school system in the United States? Are you totally disillusioned, or do you have a vision? Uh, do I have faith in it, or am I disillusioned? I, here's the strange thing about this whole experience. I loved it. I really liked the students, all ages, and I had no idea that I would actually love teaching kindergartners, or that one day I would be helping second graders, you know, color in their Mother's Day uh, birdhouse bags, you know, and they would all, I, I, I loved every grade and every kid, even the ones who made my life a living torment, because um, I could see their minds, interestingly and cleverly, trying to adapt to this environment that was not the environment they wanted to be in. And they figured out how to make it fun. Kids want so badly to be funny. And they were funny. And there was a great principle of a, of a uh, when I was in training, they brought in people from each, from the elementary school, and they would explain what an IEP was, it's an individualized education plan because there are a lot of people with ADHD or getting drugs and autistic kids and everything. But this teacher said, use humor, not the hammer. And she said, um, laugh. When they're funny, laugh, you know? And it was, it's true. It's, it, there is such an unpredictableness. I think I understand much better now why teachers become teachers even though they're underpaid, is because you go to class and it's just, there's no way that you can figure out what they're going to say that day. And, it's, and what they're going to say is so much more interesting than what they should be saying. <laughs> you know, that it is, it's, a gra it's a grand adventure. It just, there just should be, I think, there's, I, I think nothing, nothing of value gets done after lunch. You know, lunch is this horribly loud thing. Everybody comes back sweaty, and they've shattered themselves hoarse at lunch. It's the noisiest. It's just a fondue of noise. Then they come back to class, and they're exhausted, and they don't learn very much. So I think there, sh there should be shorter days. Summers work. Why, why can't there be shorter school days? But I, I loved it, and I'm, I'm, I mean, even though these were traditional schools with the traditional rules, I think some of the kids loved that they were breaking all the rules and, and were subversive. It gave them something to push against. So, Nick, thank you very opinion. much. This has been great. Thanks, thank everyone, you. for your questions as well. And um, there's going to be a chance to uh, have books autographed, have copies of Substitute, or, or if you've brought older books of Nick's, uh, we'll, we'll be uh, setting them up to, with a pen to sign them and say hello to you in person. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you all very much. <laughs>